Hi, NTO, and welcome to Steering Marinas. Uh, the purpose of this uh, video chat is that I want uh, marinas out there to learn from one another. And uh, my background has been commercial and cargo vessels. So I like to talk to people who come from different backgrounds, uh, but who are in the maritime field. So in that respect or in that regard today, I want you to please uh, share your valuable experience with the marinas out there. So welcome to the video cast. And my first question is, Antio, can you tell the viewers a little bit about the kind of ships you have been sailing on and what those ships do? Sure, uh, thanks for having me, Sam. So I was working for a conservation NGO and we were um, patrolling mainly African waters for illegal fishing. Our vessels were registered as pleasure crafts and as such, we're run by a predominantly volunteer crew with a few paid professionals in the position such as chief engineer, master, chief officer. Um, so our ships being pleasure crafts and volunteer crew, the crew, the lower ranking crew generally worked their way up from deckhands and studied externally when they could. Um, in my background, I actually started on near coastal vessels in Australia, working out of Sydney Harbour on charter vessels and also out of Airlie Beach in far north Queensland, again on charter vessels. And that was before I joined that company. Um, when I joined that company, I joined as a, a third officer using my near coastal skippers tickets. So I had a, a coxswain's ticket at the time and also a low grade engineering ticket called a MED3, which is a near coastal engineering ticket for Australia. And that allowed me to work on board their ships. Um, during that time, I was able to go to Antarctica the west coast of the US, through the Caribbean, across the Atlantic, to Africa, up to Europe, up to the Faroe Islands, uh, in between Iceland and Norway, a long way up there in the Norwegian Sea, and also some work in the Mediterranean. Um, we had uh, four ships in our fleet, um, between 33 metres and 60 metres, mainly old patrol vessels, and yeah, uh, and you, can you tell us a little bit about how long you worked on those near coastal vessels before you shifted to the, uh, the new type of vessels that you're working on? Yeah, so I started working as a commercial deckhand on a game fishing charter boat when I was 16. That's oh. the uh, youngest you can be to get your general purpose hand ticket. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that when I was 16 and then I worked as a deckhand for two years until I was 18. When I was 18, I got my first skipper's ticket, which is your, your coxswain's ticket, and allows you to command a commercial vessel up to 12 metres within 15 nautical miles of the coast. Um, so I was doing that for two years as a skipper, and then I joined uh, my last company as a third officer, and I joined them on the west coast of the USA. All right. And for somebody who's uh, following or who wants to follow your career pathway, uh, where would you advise them to go and get their certification from? Now, of course, you have done it in Australia. So we talk about Australia itself. So where yep. can they go about getting the certification from? Yeah, so the coxswain's ticket and the master less than 24 metres, you can certainly do that at a training institution such as TAFE or AMC here in Tasmania. Um, and I believe there are a few other private institutions on, on the mainland, up and down the coast, actually. So... Yeah, there's, there's many places you can do it. You can take two options. You can go get your general purpose hand ticket and start accruing sea time um, because that, you need that to accrue valid sea time. And you can also complete a task book, which will give you a reduction in, in your sea time. And then you can keep working up through your tickets. You know, I started with a general purpose hand ticket when I was 16 and now I'm studying for my deck watch keepers here at AMC. So I've worked my whole way up through General Purpose and Coxon, Master Lesson 24, Master Lesson 35, and now and now this. And I've just been, as I get the sea time, I come back to study, I complete the study, I complete the orals, and I go back to sea to complete more sea time towards my next ticket. And in this case, my next ticket will be my chief officers after I complete orals for my watch keepers. And, and that's fantastic. That's very inspiring. Uh, and you, of course, you are now going to get your uh, second mate's uh, unlimited license very soon and going into your chief mate's license as well. But what uh, I think the viewers should take a note of or make a note of rather is what has been a very inspiring and long journey. And uh, what I want to sh uh, show through your journey is that uh, they should not be looking for uh, 
a shortcut you know you have put in the work you have put in the number of years and uh, you sailed on a number of boats before you've come to this stage so i think uh, sometimes uh, uh, you know you have to put in the work and the, you can't take a shortcut path uh, and if you were somebody like a 18 year old coming out of school or if somebody wants to find employment uh, what tips would you give them how how do they go about finding work like how did you find work or what tips can you give them on, if they want to work on boats like the ones that you have been working on how do they go about finding jobs there yeah, so I mean, firstly, I have a real passion for seafaring and being at sea and working on boats. And I think that's really important if you, you do want to take this path. Uh, there are a number of NGOs and organisations that take volunteer crew. And it's just a matter of finding, you know, whether you would like to volunteer for that, that type of company and applying. And most of these companies will have an application form for them. So there's many different companies doing a, a wide range of work all around the world. And that's a great way to get in, accrue sea time, learn some really valuable skills. Um, and you can use that sea time in most cases towards gaining your certificate of competency like I have. So even though they were registered as non-commercial pleasure crafts, we were engaged in uh, quite a lot of serious work, even governmental work, but still registered as pleasure crafts. All my sea time is valid. And that's how I'm able to be here now at Australian Maritime College working towards my deck watch keepers. And that's again some fantastic advice here from you um, because we all mostly come from a traditional path of commercial ships and that is the path we are very familiar with but i think out there now people will uh, hear your story and they will realize this different path something that maybe they have not heard of they don't know uh, so when of course when you are saying voluntary work uh, you have a sh you you talk about the advantages of getting the sea time that is required for examination but of course they can't expect a salary then it's voluntary work so they have to be ready for that isn't it yeah voluntary work but you know many organize as you prove that you know you're you're there for the long term a lot of the companies in my company they will start to pay you a wage um it may not be as high as you would get in the commercial world but if you come in as a, a qualified engineering officer or qualified deck officer, very, very likely that you can find a paid position. It, it does happen quite a lot. So, um, yeah, you, you just have to see, you know, what the company has available and, you know, speak to, speak to people on board if you can. I mean, my company, yeah, you can, my old company, sorry, you can definitely find a, a paid position as a deck officer if you have the prerequisite experience and qualifications you most likely find a paid position, but generally everyone starts volunteer. They see how you go, if you like it, and then they, they'll offer you something. So right. and, it's also, and this also is, could be because uh, seafaring is quite a challenging profession and many people are not prepared for the challenge that uh, you normally face on ships and that could be the reason. Um, now, and a lot of people, a lot of students, a lot of young mariners come up to us and they ask us whether they should do their certification first or they should find a job first. Uh, what advice would you give them uh, in the current job market? I know it's not easy to get jobs, but uh, this question, how do you answer this question? Should they get their certification first and then applying for jobs? Or should they first find a job and then start studying? Um, I think like what I did was I got qualified first through my, my near coastal tickets in Australia. And then I was applying for the, you know, these jobs with the, the international companies. Um, and I'm in that same position now where I've, I've gotten qualified and I'm going to have to start looking for work in, in the future. Um, I think it's always better to, to get qualified, but there's also the cadet route, which I did not take. So the cadets, you know, they find a company first they, and then they can come and do their, their pre-seed training and then they go to sea. So, um, yeah, I guess it depends on the stream and what, what's available to you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that what Antio is trying to say is there's not a single defined pathway. There are no. many pathways and you can try out whatever works for you. Yeah. Uh, I think applying for a job and studying. But yes, absolutely yeah. upskilling yourself, getting that certification shows that you are serious about yeah, exactly. the profession and you should have a pro uh, passion for it as well. Now, Antio, the, uh, one of the reasons I, I wanted to talk to you is, of course, that you come from a you know, kind of a, a non-conventional background, but also because uh, you, like you just now mentioned, you did not take the traditional path of a cadet. Now, when you came for your studies here at AMC, and this is very different from the previous certification courses that you did, I'm sure this is more challenging. There is much more uh, different subjects and the intensity of the studies is quite a lot. Now, uh, because you did not take that traditional path of a cadet, what challenges did you face for somebody who was probably on the fence, they want to study, but they're not sure what to expect 
what kind of advice or would you give them how should they go about preparing for uh, this kind of studies oh, preparing for the studies i mean yeah as you said definitely very intense and i wasn't sure what level it would be at but uh advice is you know every all the teachers especially here at amc they're there to help many people have passed these courses before but only if you put in the required work if there's readings that uh, your lecturers suggest you read them you know if there's readings that your classmates suggest you read them make sure you are following like industry news to you know get involved and engaged with, what, with what's happening seek sources outside of what has been uh, provided to you and just make sure that um yeah, that you can try and enjoy it and it'll be, become a, a whole lot easier. But the main thing is you must apply yourself. Like I was very worried about my maths before I joined, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I didn't do maths in the last year of high school. So mm -hmm. I was worried about that. And then this year, mm -hmm. celestial navigation, stability, mm -hmm. etc. I had to really focus hard on getting my maths up there. And I did, mm -hmm. and I you know, was able to do quite well. So, mm -hmm. but it's all about applying yourself, putting in that time yeah. and you, you will succeed and it will become easier as well. Yeah. So. yeah, absolutely. I think this is very important as well. It just, it does get easier if you, if you, if you keep at it. Uh, and you know, of course, I know you personally, and I know how good you are with the math and everything, but <laughs> I've observed that uh, uh, students often struggle with math and you are, of course, a younger uh, uh, seafarer. There are people who come as a mature as students or people who have taken a break from studies for a long time and they come back or somebody like you who did not study math in high school. Now math, because math is there in many subjects here and it's kind of a struggle for many students. What advice would you give them before they start their studies? How can they go about uh, preparing themselves for it? Is there something that they can do or you would have done differently? Yeah, I mean, I would have tried to seek help for maths before I came. You know, mm. I would have maybe got some year 12 or 11 textbooks and worked through them or mm. sought out a maths tutor or spoken to someone who'd gone through this course before and maybe gotten some of the nautical mathematics material or mm -hmm. you know some of the material that was going to be studied on and had to read through it before I came to the course if possible. I think that would have been quite good. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, but, that's yeah, very saying that the maths yeah. the, the maths is not super intense. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of getting familiar with it mm -hmm. and uh, you, you'll be okay. Yeah, I think that's very uh, that's valuable advice as well uh, that people should talk to ex students, students who have gone through the grind, have a chat with them and find out uh, what level of studies or math, or especially math because math is a challenge. What they will be facing in the studies here. Um, and here before I, I I want to take a couple of more minutes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this kind of ships that you are sailing, or you are talking about uh, the uh, the kind of current kind of ships that you are sailing, or you can talk more about it because I'm not very familiar. What is it that you guys were doing? You spoke very briefly about it going into Africa. So what was it that okay. you were doing on the ships here? Yeah, yeah. So the, the work I was doing, we were acting as a fisheries patrol vessel for governments who did not have their own ships. So mm -hmm. our company or our organization would provide a platform for these uh, nations to be able to enforce their fisheries and conservation law. So we would bring these government partners onto our vessel and that would consist of fisheries officers and generally um, some form of military or navy mm -hmm. and then we would use our small craft so eight and a half meter ribs you know with 400 horsepower outboards mm -hmm. and we would take these government officials over to fishing vessels to conduct inspections at sea and they were able to enforce their fisheries law and we'd also patrol borders to monitor for illegal fishing monitor any activity on the uh within their exclusive economic zone regarding you know transshipment or illegal fishing methods stuff like that so we just served as a platform for the these governments to be able to enforce their fisheries and conservation law oh very interesting and how long uh, do you normally stay at sea on the like how long are the contracts for or something about that as well yeah so generally we do about a 20-day patrol and then we come in to uh, do a crew change with the, the government partners. So that was not, that's a, that's a rough estimate. Sometimes we stay longer, you know, sometimes be a month and then you come back in for a couple of days or this just depends on the campaign and what's going on time of year, et cetera. But I have been on campaigns where Southern Ocean campaign, we chased the vessel for 110 days. Uh, they oh. then scuttled their own ship off the coast of Sao Tome in the Gulf of Guinea, right on the equator. Wow. Uh, so, and when we stepped, you know, I joined the vessel in Hobart, Tasmania, and I stepped off the vessel in Bremen, Germany, after 137 days at sea. So, wow. Wow. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm sure you have so uh, many interesting stories and <laughs> have the luxury of time of getting to know all these stories. I wish we could talk more about that. Um, but thank you, Antio. But can you, before you end, uh, uh, people who will be listening to you and they will want to work on these kind of ships, uh, is there any special certification that they have to do or they can go and do because they might think, oh, we may not be able to work on these kind of ships. Is there any certification that you have to do, special certification? Um, for for a junior role such a, a deckhand or a cook yeah. or a media, you know, a photographer or someone, oh, yeah. not really, but mm -hmm. to really enhance your chances and also bring some value to the crew as someone joining fresh, I would really suggest the STCW basic safety training course where you cover your sea survival, firefighting, security, first aid, etc. I think that's a really invaluable course for anyone who wants to be involved in, in seafaring. Um, I understand the course is a bit expensive, but it will give you access to, you know, all ships because that is the minimum to, to get on board for, you know, and especially a volunteer organization that will really give you a good feather in your cap to have a great chance. So. Right. So people out there should consider these courses, even though they're mm. expensive, they should consider it like an investment. That's exactly right. To get a job and... Thank you very much, NTO, for joining us and for sharing your experience. I'm sure people out there uh, will really value hearing your experience and a different pathway that you have taken. I think this is something that we can learn from it. Uh, thanks for joining us and really appreciate your uh, talk and time today. Bye.